All right, let's go on to your spelling words for this week. All right, fourth grade, your spelling words this week are focusing on three-letter blends. Now, three-letter blends are usually when you have three consonant letters that are, that are right next to each other uh, that you say together. So the three-letter blends that we're going to focus on are thra, shra, scra, spra, stra, and spla. And we're going to see these throughout the words as we read through them. Your first word is shred, shriek, shrimp, shrink, script, screw, screech, straighten, straps, strand, sprout, sprawl, sprang, splashing, splotch, thrill, throb, throat, thrift, through, choose, photo, whine, threaten, and strictly. So you see these blends throughout the words. Now remember your words, you've got 25 words, 20 of them are new, three of them are review words from last week, and two challenge words. So these are the words you're going to be tested on. All right, next, let's go into our grammar notes and our ELA notes for the week. Okay, next we're going to talk about nouns. We're going to review common and proper nouns and we're going to introduce a new kind called collective nouns. Now we know that a common noun is a noun that names any person, place, or thing. So a cat, a dog, a house, a tree, a lamp, a girl, a boy, all these things can be any noun. It's not telling us specifically which one. So it's not telling me the name of the boy or the girl. It's not telling me uh, what kind of shoe it is. It's not telling me the name of the park or the building. Common nouns can be anything. Now a proper noun names the specific person, place, or thing. Proper nouns begin with a capital letter because they name something specific. And if there's more than one word in the proper noun, then the first letter of every important word is given a capital letter. And I'm going to go over some examples with you. So we're going to capitalize the names of the week, the names of the days of the week, uh, the names of months and holidays, any important words that are in a title of a publication, so like a book or a newspaper or an article names of different languages, names of races and nationalities, and historical events. Also the names of products and any geographical locations, so the names of you know, countries and cities, those are things that will also be capitalized. Now I did put a few examples for each one on how to do that, and you can see those right there on the screen. So, for the days, we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, obviously, all of those begin with a capital letter. The first letter in the name of all of the months is capital. Holidays like Memorial Day, Eid al-Adha, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, all of those begin with capital letters. The important words in a title of a book, like the mouse and the motorcycle, these two words that are in between that are not important words, the and and the the, we don't capitalize. The only time we would capitalize those is like you're seeing right here at the beginning when they're the first word in the title. Or if you look at the book, Where the Wild Things Are, again, you'll see the important words are capitalized. Any other words are not capitalized. The names of different languages, races, nationalities, uh, historical events like the Civil War, names of products like um, Nike shoes, geographic locations like Lake Tahoe or Niagara Falls. All of those are proper nouns because they tell us about a specific person, place, or thing. Now the next kind that we're going to talk about are called collective nouns. Collective nouns are words that describe a group. So some common collective nouns you've heard of are like the word family. A family is a group of related people. A herd is like a group of land animals like sheep or buffalo. A flock is a group of different kinds of birds. A litter is a group of baby animals like puppies or kittens. An army is a group of soldiers. A band is a group of musicians. A swarm is a group of 
flying insects like bees. So collective nouns are nouns that name a group of nouns. And, um, and you've already used a lot of them. If we say a class, you know, if we talk about the second grade class, we know that we're talking about all the students in second grade. Or if I talk about uh, the fifth grade class, I'm talking about all the students in fifth grade. Okay, next we're going to talk about regular and irregular plural nouns. Now, regular plural nouns are ones where you add either an S or an ES to the end of the word to make it a plural. And remember, plural means more than one. So how do you know when to add an S or an ES? You know you have to add an ES if the ending of your word has an S, SH, CH, X, or Z as the final letter. So if you have a word that ends with S, like class, class becomes classes. And you can hear the is in when you're saying ES as opposed to when you're saying S, where you, instead of saying cats, it just says S at the end. But classes says is at the end. So you can hear the E and the S. So that's a word that ends with S. For SH, wish becomes wishes. Words that end with CH are like watch. So watch becomes watches. A word that ends with X is like box becomes boxes and buzz becomes buzzes. So if your word ends with an S, SH, CH, X, or Z, you are going to use an ES at the end of it. Now, when do you add an S? We only add an S to the end of a word that doesn't have those same letters at the end or it ends with a vowel and the letter Y. If it ends with a vowel and the letter Y and anything other than these letters, then you only add the S to it, like cats, toys, shoes, books, schools, boys, girls. You just put an S. So this one, vowel and then Y, same thing over here, vowel and then Y. Now, sometimes you have a word that ends with a Y where you have to change that Y to an I. So if your word ends with a consonant letter plus the letter Y, then you change that Y to an I before you add the ES. So enemy becomes enemies, fly becomes flies, library becomes libraries, bunny becomes bunnies. So consonant letter, that means not a vowel. Consonant Y becomes I and then ES. Now I also want to talk to you about irregular plurals. So up here is regular plurals. Regular plurals end with an S or an ES. But irregular plurals do not. Irregular plural nouns have a different spelling when they become a plural. That means they do not follow the SES rule. So some examples of irregular plurals are ones that you know, like child becomes children, man becomes men, ox becomes oxen, person becomes people, goose becomes geese, tooth becomes teeth, foot becomes feet, and life becomes lives. And you can see that the spelling is changing when you're going from singular form to plural form. Now there are some words that don't change their spelling when they go from singular to plural. That means there's the same word when you're talking about one and if you're talking about more than one. So deer, you talk about one deer or a group of deer, one sheep or a flock of sheep, one pair of scissors or lots of scissors, one moose or lots of moose, one salmon or lots of salmon, one fish or lots of fish. So these are words that are that their spelling works for both singular and plural. And the way that you know which one it is, is by looking at the context clues. So look at the words around it, and they will tell you if that sentence is talking about one or more than one. So if I read a sentence that says, uh, the group of deer stopped by the stream. I know that the word group is telling me that it's more than one. Or if, it, or if it says all the sheep were grazing in the meadow. So all tells me it's more than one. Or if I have a sentence that says 
can you please pass me my scissors? I'm talking about myself and I'm just talking about my scissors. So it's one that's singular. Or I saw a moose on the path. If it says a moose, a is referring to one. If, I, if it says I saw many moose on the path, many will tell me that it's more than one and so on. Now there's a special rule for most words that end with F or LF. And I say most words because there are words that don't follow that rule that we're going to talk about as well. So usually if a word ends with F or LF as the final letters, that F is going to become a V before you add ES. So calf becomes calves, half becomes halves, wife becomes wives, elf becomes elves. And these are all words that, that end with either that F and, you know, silent E over here, or LF in it, and you're changing that F to a V. Now, there are a couple of, of exceptions. Uh, one of them is the word roof. Roof becomes roofs. That does not change into a V. Or chef becomes chefs. That also does not change into a V. And lastly, we're going to talk about comparative and superlative forms. Now, when we're talking about comparative and superlative, these are words to compare between two adjectives. So when you're describing something, um, you use either ER in the comparative form or EST in the superlative form. Now, when we're comparing, we're usually talking about two things. So we add ER. So tall becomes taller. He is taller than his brother. So the two that I'm comparing is him and his brother. Big becomes bigger. And there's a reason I made this in bold. We're going to talk about it farther down in, in our notes. I can say this book is bigger than the last one. So I'm comparing this book to the last book, just the two things. Fast becomes faster. I can run faster than my sister. So I'm comparing myself to my sister. So just those two things. Now, when we're talking about superlative, we think super, so the most. And superlative is used to compare three or more things, and it usually has, is, has an EST at the end of it. So clean becomes cleanest. Her room is the cleanest in the whole house. So I'm comparing her room to all of the other rooms in the house. So that's more than two. Bright becomes brightest. The sun is one of the brightest stars in our galaxy. So I'm comparing the sun to all of the other stars. So it's more than two. Strong becomes strongest. Superman was the strongest superhero of them all. So I'm comparing Superman to all of the other superheroes, which again is more than two. Now, important rules that we want to remember over here. If a word ends with a vowel and then a consonant, we're going to double that final consonant before we add the ER or the EST. And this is where I'm, I told you I had highlighted uh, bigger, the G's and bigger, because it ends with a vowel and then a consonant. So I double that final consonant and then I added the ER or the EST. Now I did the same thing with the word sad, sadder or saddest. Double that final consonant and then I added the ER, double that final consonant, then I added the EST. Now, if a word ends with a consonant and then a Y, we're going to change that Y into an I before we add that ER or EST. So happy becomes happier or happiest. Dry becomes drier or driest. So consonant Y becomes consonant I, ER, consonant I, EST. And if a word ends with a silent E, we drop that final E before we add the ER or the EST. So cute becomes cuter or cutest. Okay, let's jump into our weekly stories. We're going to get both of our books open, our reading and writing workshop, as well as our literature anthology. 
and we're going to jump into unit two, week three. So unit two, week three is right here. The story titled The Buffalo Are Back. That's going to be our story for this week. And it is a narrative nonfiction. Genre, narrative nonfiction. The Buffalo Are Back by Jean Craighead George. Paintings by Wendell Minor. In a time long ago, an orange buffalo calf was born. He wobbled to his feet and blinked. A lark flew to the top of a six-foot blade of grass and sang as sweetly as a panpipe. A town of prairie dogs barked. The green-gold grasses of the plains rippled like waves from horizon to horizon. On that day, in the mid-1800s, 75 million buffalo roamed in North America. In little more than 50 years, there would be almost none. What happened? The answer is a story of the American Indians, the buffalo, and the grass. The American Indians On the day that the calf was born, the air was smoky. The Indians who lived on the plains were setting the grasses ablaze as they had for thousands of years. The fire was good for the prairie. The calf may have been afraid of the flames, but they kept the trees from taking over the grasslands. The fire's ashes put nutrients into the soil, making the grass healthier for the buffalo that ate it. By taking care of the grass, the Indians took care of the buffalo. In return, the buffalo took care of the Indians and the plains. Buffalo were the Indians' food and were used to make their shelter and clothing. The buffalo never ate too much grass, and their sharp hooves helped rainwater reach into the soil, keeping the prairie healthy. The orange calf learned to roll in a dust wallow. He watched the prairie chickens show off their exotic feathers. From the Mississippi to the Rocky Mountains and from the Gulf of Mexico up into Canada, the buffalo herds grazed the Great Plains. Stop and Check Summarize Why did the Indians set the grasses on fire? Summarize using details from the text. The Buffalo In the mid-1800s, change came to the plains. First it was white fur hunters. They stacked the beautiful buffalo hides in pointed canoes and sold them east for profit. Then the American explorers came, who shot many animals for fun. Buffalo made good targets for the hunters because they are big and often stand still. But it was settlers from the east and the American government that killed almost all of the buffalo herds. After the Civil War, the government bought huge tracts of land from the Indians. They forced many Indians to go to reservations and sold the land to settlers. Families from Europe and the East Coast rushed west to settle the rich black prairie land. But there was trouble on the plains. The government broke its treaties with the Indians, so the Indians fought back and won several battles against the United States Army. Then the government saw another way to defeat the Indians. Soldiers and settlers were encouraged to shoot every buffalo they saw or drive whole herds over cliffs. Without the buffalo for food, shelter, and clothing, the Indians could not survive on the plains. Most of the last wild buffalo went down in dust and gunfire. 
said the great Sioux chief Sitting Bull, who defeated General George A. Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn, a cold wind blew across the prairie when the last buffalo fell, a death wind for my people. And the settlers soon discovered a death wind for the prairie. The Grass With the death of the buffalo, the Indian wars were over. The settlers faced a new fight, the Battle of the Grasses. Over the eons, the prairie grasses had adapted to the Great Plains' frequent droughts by growing tough roots to hold in moisture. These roots were wide and deep and held the rich soil in place. The buffalo's sharp hooves and the Indians' prairie fires had helped keep the grasses healthy. But the new settlers did not understand the importance of the grass. Early settlers were ranchers and cowboys. They brought fences and cattle to the plains. The cattle did not roam, so they ate too much of the grass within their fences. Their flat hooves packed the earth. Air and rainwater no longer reached into the soil. Later settlers wanted to farm the land, so they tore out the grass and planted crops to sell. Steel plows and steam tractors were invented to conquer the grassland, and the great plow-up began. Wheat, corn, and soybeans were planted. These crops have shallow, fragile roots. At first, the crops flourished in the prairie sunshine and timely rains. New railroads carried the harvests to distant markets. Now, not one orange buffalo wobbled to its feet. The larks that had once eaten the insects living in the grass did not sing. The prairie dogs were silent. Without the buffalo, without the grasses, and without the Indians to care for them, the prairie was in danger. The settlers would soon learn why. Stop and check. Summarize. How was the great plow-up both good and bad in the beginning? Drought came as it had before. Billions of grasshoppers swept down on the plains. Long ago, when drought came and grasshoppers chewed the healthy grass, the plants would grow back. Their tough roots always survived. But when the fragile crops were chewed by grasshoppers, nothing grew back. Suddenly, the grasshoppers laid eggs and flew on. The farmers replanted their crops. They did not know they had begun to destroy the prairie. When the buffalo lived on the prairie, their sharp hooves helped rain reach deep into the earth, and the tough roots of the grass held in the wet. Now no moisture remained in the soil. The farmer's crops withered and died. In the 1930s, the plowed earth finally crumbled to dust. The wind eroded the land, picking up the dust and boiling it into terrifying black clouds. The clouds rained dirt. Barns, farms, houses, and towns were buried beneath the dust. People coughed, choked, and grew ill. Many died. Hungry and penniless, plains farmers and townsmen packed up their belongings and sold their worthless land to the government. The prairie soil had blown away. The land was no longer rich. The farmers climbed into old cars and left. The great plow-up had been a disaster. In just over fifty years, it had destroyed the buffalo, the protective prairie grasses, and the Indians who had cared for both. What could be done to save the prairie? The Prairie Comeback In the beginning of the 1900s, Americans elected a president who had once been a hunter on the Great Plains. He knew and loved the land and wanted to protect it for future generations. Nature-loving President Theodore Roosevelt especially wanted to save the buffalo. He was very fond of the great American grazer with its humped back and shaggy coat. So he sent out scouts to look for wild buffalo. The scouts came home with nothing. All the scouts but one. 
a naturalist named W. T. Hornaday looked and looked and would not give up. On a tip from a Crow Indian, he rode his horse into a secluded meadow in Montana, a place that had been hidden away from the world. There before him grazed three hundred buffalo. A little orange calf wobbled to her feet and blinked. A lark flew to a blade of grass and sang as sweetly as a panpipe. There had been seventy-five million buffalo on the plains. Now there were three hundred left in the wild. People who understood the land, led by Hornaday, knew the buffalo had to be saved. The president helped. Roosevelt established the National Bison Range in Montana and made it illegal to shoot buffalo. Over the years, more land was set aside in western states for the great grazing herds, which were beginning to grow. Thanks to Roosevelt, the orange calf in Montana romped with other calves and rolled in the dust. Her herd grew in numbers. Many were sent to national parks and wildlife refuges that had been established to start new herds. As the dust storms attacked farms and cities, the government worked to save the prairie. Farmers were taught to plant and grow crops in curves instead of straight lines. The contour plowing helped to prevent dirt from blowing away. Government workers planted trees with deep roots to hold moisture in the soil and break the wind. When the rains returned, farmers planted grass between their curving rows of corn to hold the soil in place. Crops flourished again. One day, a young girl walked into her house in Kansas waving a six-foot blade of grass. Where did you find that? her father asked. That's buffalo grass. It's been extinct for years, or so we thought. In my schoolyard, she said. That is land that was never plowed, her father told her. Like many older people living on the prairie, he longed to see the beautiful grasses again. Let's try to find more of these tall native grasses, he said. Perhaps the tall grass could come back to the plains. People like the girl's father rounded up kids, parents, botanists, farmers, and merchants. They searched the places the plows had never reached, graveyards, old railroad beds, and crumbling fence rows. There they found small stands of the native grasses, blue stem, gamma, bunch, and buffalo grass. They raised them and sowed the seeds on abandoned farms and public lands. The grasses flourished tall and graceful. Groups that worked to protect nature purchased 30,000 acres where native grasses had been grown. This nature preserve in Kansas is called the Tall Grass Prairie Preserve. Into the tall grass they released 300 buffalo. One morning, not too long ago, a young man just out of graduate school galloped his horse across the prairie preserve, counting buffalo for the buffalo census. Suddenly he reined in his horse. An orange calf wobbled to his feet and blinked. Welcome, little calf, the Wichita Indian youth called. You are America's 200,081st buffalo. A lark flew to the top of a six-foot blade of grass and sang as sweetly as a panpipe. The buffalo are back. Stop and check. Make predictions. What can you predict about the future of the buffalo? Use the text to support your response. All right, that takes us to the end of our first story. We're going to jump into our second short story. It also uses our same vocabulary words for this week. This is just two pages over in your textbooks. Genre expository text. Compare texts. Read how a barred owl is part of the food chain in the forest. Energy in the ecosystem. 
In spring, the climate of the eastern woodlands warms up after the cold winter. Daylight lasts longer. By the middle of spring, the sun's energy has awakened forests. Trees bud and put forth leaves. Grasses and ferns pop up from the forest floor. Songbirds return. The woods come alive with sound. At night, the forest echoes with peepers, bullfrogs, and the yip-yip of the red fox. One call can be heard often from the forest. It sounds like, Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Who, 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 ah. This is the call of the barred owl, the night hunter of the forest. From its perch, high in oak or hickory trees, the owl studies the forest floor. Far below, voles and mice eat grasses and grubs. They do not see the hunter watching them. The Living Woodlands All forest plants, animals, and other organisms, or living things, depend on non-living elements. A forest's ecosystem needs a balance of sunlight, moisture, temperature, and soil nutrients. Any imbalance in these non-living elements will harm the forest. For example, a drought or long period without rain will kill plants. Without plants, animals die. In forests of the eastern United States, energy from sunlight and nutrients in water and soil allow plants to grow. These plants form the first link in the forest food chain. A food chain is the path that energy takes from one organism to another in the form of food. Energy from the sun flows through the food chain, joining all the plants and animals in an ecosystem. Several links in the chain join plants with the creature that sits in the treetops, the barred owl. The energy from this bird's feeding plays an important role in the first links of the food chain. How? Below, layers of plant life in a forest produce food by using energy from the sun and nutrients in soil and water. Forest Food Chain The forest food chain begins with organisms that make their own food. They are called producers. Grasses, trees, and other green plants are producers that feed forest animals. Organisms that cannot make their own food are known as consumers. Any animal that eats plants or plant products is a consumer. Some forest consumers, such as rabbits, are herbivores that eat only plants. Other mammals, such as voles and mice, are omnivores. They eat plants as well as insects, worms, and grubs. Higher up on the food chain are organisms that eat other consumers. In the forest, birds of prey such as owls occupy this link in the chain. Owls are carnivores, which means they eat only other animals. Since owls cannot make their own food, they are also consumers in the food chain. Sun, energy source. Grass, producer. Mouse, consumer, omnivore. Owl, consumer, carnivore. Fungi, decomposers. Back to the cycle. Fungi play a different role in the food chain. They are decomposers. Decomposers recycle all wastes and remains from plants and animals back into the ecosystem. The dead material becomes soil nutrients, which help plants grow. With sunlight and water, the cycle begins again. When an owl eats a mouse or a vole, it digests the meat and organs of those animals. However, owls cannot digest fur, teeth, or bones. These are formed into oval pellets. The owl throws up these balls of fur and bone after every meal. Owl pellets are often found on the ground around owl nesting places. They provide food and shelter for moths, beetles, and fungi. If you are near a forest at night, listen carefully. Do you hear it? Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Right. 
Owl pellets are an important source of food and shelter for some insects and fungi. The bones, teeth, and fur that make up each pellet cannot be digested by owls. All right, let's jump into our Readers and Writers Workshop book, and we'll go through our Unit 2, Week 3 story there as well. Our story is called Rescuing Our Reefs. Genre, Narrative Nonfiction, Rescuing Our Reefs. Essential Question, How Are All Living Things Connected? Read how plants and animals are connected in a coral reef ecosystem. Sitting on the side of the boat, the photographer fixes her scuba tank and mask. She waves to a man in a fishing boat. Then she dives backwards into the clear waters of the Florida Keys. She swims, breathing through her regulator. A large, colorful coral reef is laid out before her eyes. Sea anemones, red hind fish, gaudy parrotfish, yellow angelfish, and other animals ignore her as they go about their business. Life in this reef has flourished and grown. Connections The photographer knows the plants and animals in a reef ecosystem need each other to survive. Reefs are made up of billions of tiny animals called coral polyps. Plant-like algae live inside the coral. The algae use a process called photosynthesis to turn energy from the sun into food for themselves and the coral. In return, the coral gives the algae a home and the carbon dioxide needed for photosynthesis. Algae are a part of the food chain called producers. Producers make their own energy. The photographer sees a blue and yellow parrotfish nibbling at the coral. She takes a picture. The parrotfish breaks apart the coral to get to the algae-filled polyps inside. In a food chain, the parrotfish is a consumer. Consumers cannot produce their own energy. As the parrotfish eats the algae, energy is passed through the food chain. In the distance, the photographer notices the long silver body of a barracuda lurking. The sea grass ripples in the current, swaying back and forth. It almost hides the hungry predator. She snaps a photo and swims on. Parrotfish Coral bleaching The photographer shoots more photos as she swims. The reef must have looked like this hundreds of years ago. But then she stops and stares at a big area of bleached white coral. Once colorful, the whitish coral now looks like the broken pieces of a crumbled castle. Coral depends on a natural balance to stay healthy. Climate change and pollution can cause an imbalance. Some areas have dried up from droughts, while others have had more rain. Too much sun and warmer ocean temperatures can cause coral bleaching. If pollution gets into the water or the water gets too warm, the relationship between the coral and algae breaks down. The algae stop making food. The coral ejects the algae. The algae are what give the coral its color. The coral loses its color. It starves because it needs the algae to make food for it. A food chain shows the transfer of energy from one species to another. Energy source. Producer. Consumer. Many plants and animals depend on the coral for food and shelter. As more and more coral reefs die, many animals and plants that live in these reefs may become extinct. The beautiful reef the photographer had seen earlier would resemble the white, crumbling reef before her. Balancing Act She turned and swam back to the boat. Later today, she would send her photographs to the Nature Conservancy. It is an organization that works to rescue our fragile reefs. Scientists there are trying to rebuild the reefs by attaching small pieces of staghorn coral to concrete blocks. Staghorn coral is used to grow new coral. 
Once the coral grows, the blocks are planted in the reefs. The photographer hopes her pictures will help spread the word. They show the relationship between pollution, climate change, and coral bleaching. She breaks through the water's surface and climbs into the boat. I got some good shots of the healthy reef and the sick reef, she shouts to her partner. Once aboard, she immediately begins putting her photos on her laptop. All right, so let's get into our comprehension strategy and skill for this week. Our comprehension strategy this week is to summarize. Now, when we summarize, we're taking just the most important parts of the reading or the text that we were looking at. And usually when you're telling somebody about something that you read, you're giving them a summary. So you're summarizing the information. Your comprehension skill for this week is focusing on the main idea and the details. Remember, the main idea is the most important part of the writing that the author wants you to understand, and the details help to support that main idea. Summarize. When you summarize, you retell the most important details in a paragraph or section of text. Summarize sections of Rescuing Our Reefs to help you understand the information. Find text evidence. As you read, identify the most important details. Summarize the first paragraph of the Connections section on page 123 of Rescuing Our Reefs. Connections. The photographer knows the plants and animals in a reef ecosystem need each other to survive. Reefs are made up of billions of tiny animals called coral polyps. Plant-like algae live inside the coral. The algae use a process called photosynthesis to turn energy from the sun into food for themselves and the coral. In return, the coral gives the algae a home and the carbon dioxide needed for photosynthesis. Algae are a part of the food chain called producers. Producers make their own energy. In a coral reef ecosystem, the algae and coral polyps help each other. The algae produces food through photosynthesis, and the coral provide carbon dioxide and a home for the algae. Main Idea and Details The main idea is the most important idea that an author presents in a paragraph or section of text. Key details give important information to support the main idea. Find text evidence. When I reread the section Connections on page 123 in Rescuing Our Reefs, I can reread to find the key details. Then I can think about what those details have in common. Now I can figure out the main idea of the section. Graphic Organizer. Main idea. Animals and plants in the coral reef depend on each other. Detail. Algae produce food through the process of photosynthesis. Detail. The coral provides a home and carbon dioxide for the algae. Detail. Parrotfish eat the algae inside the coral. Caption. All the key details tell about the main idea. All right, next we're going to take a minute to think about our genre for this week's story. And we're working with another narrative nonfiction. So remember, narrative nonfiction stories are telling you a story, but they're also giving you information. So they're presenting you with facts. And nonfiction means that it's something that actually happened. Our vocab strategy for this week is context clues. And remember, your context clues are what you use to figure out what something means. When you come across something in your text that doesn't make sense to you, we use our context clues or the words and sentences around the confusing part of piece of information to help figure out what it means and what the author is trying to tell us.
Genre, informational text. Narrative nonfiction. Rescuing our reefs is narrative nonfiction. Narrative nonfiction tells a story, presents facts about a topic, includes text features. Find text evidence. Rescuing our reefs is narrative nonfiction. It tells a story while providing facts about reefs. It also includes text features. Text features. Headings. Headings tell what a section of text is mostly about. Flowchart. A flowchart shows information from the text in a visual way. Context clues. As you read Rescuing Our Reefs, you may come across words you don't know. To figure out the meaning of an unfamiliar word, use the words, phrases, and sentences near it for clues. Find text evidence. On page 123 of Rescuing Our Reefs, I see that the narrator says, In a food chain, the parrotfish is a consumer. I'm not sure what a consumer is. I read the next sentence, consumers cannot produce their own energy. Now I know what consumer means. In a food chain, the parrotfish is a consumer. Consumers cannot produce their own energy. All right, that takes us to the end of our notes for this week, fourth grade. If you have any questions, definitely let me know. Otherwise, I hope you have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.